All right, welcome back, everybody, to week three, episode three of the Servants Church Big Questions podcast. Don't forget that this is for you guys, so please be sending us in your questions. We're going to look at a specific question from one of you guys today. Um, we thank you, John, for how in our previous sessions we've been looking at end times, uh, revelation, and I think one of the important things we drew out was that everyone can agree Jesus is coming back, and it's pretty clear as well that some things are going to happen before he comes back. So um, before we get into this week, uh, for those of you just listening to this podcast, and the same goes for last week's episode as well, if you'd like any of the information, if you'd like to see John's cheat sheet, how he goes about giving you the definitions and all the scripture we use, then you can contact the church office for a PDF and the PowerPoint slides that we've based this on. And if you're watching on YouTube, they'll appear um, as we speak about them. So... Um, John, this time I, I want to read out a question to you from uh, our church. This was submitted to us. Um, I'm going to just read it word for word as they've put it. <clears throat> what will you do if you can't buy or sell or travel without a vaccine certificate? Or similarly, if only digital transactions were accepted by all vital services. So that's like food, utilities, fuel, etc. You know, having to go uh, cashless. Yeah, it's interesting that, that the question was posed, what would I do specifically? Um, and I don't know if I'll answer it with what I would do specifically, because I don't know if I'll know until we get there. But it's important that we recognize the question is based actually on a, a way that people view Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18. So Ben, why don't you go ahead and read those verses? Sure, I've got them here. So Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 18 say... He causes all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. John, freaky stuff. I, I've heard all kinds of ideas about this beast, the number. Um, I mean, it's kind of clear just from reading it that there's something going on about selling and trading here and accepting a mark. But who, who, who is he from the first few words that he causes all and to receive a mark? Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because uh, the he refers to uh, the beast that's it's talked about later on in the section. And in Revelation chapter 13, there's two beasts uh, identified. One corresponds to what we see in Daniel chapter 7. The other one seems to be his kind of partner in crime um, who's helping him. Most people would see both these as some sort of counterfeits to uh, what, what God uh, wants his people to do. Um, it really depends on how you look at or how you interpret the book of Revelation. It will depend on how you interpret what, what's going on here. Right, yes. Yeah. So we were looking at that in our last session, weren't we? There's the different views on the millennium and how much people think is still yet to happen, how much has already happened. So I, I'd want to ask from the stream we're considering, from what the lenses we've built up in the past two sessions, um, this, this beast guy, I've heard that it could have been someone in the past, maybe Nero, but it, it, is this scenario of accepting the mark or not something that we can expect to happen in the future? Well... We did look last week at sort of three main views, three main lenses that we could use to look at all of eschatology or all kind of end times passages. Um, we, we did say last week that I'm coming from a pre-millennial lens. Um, and so that does affect how we would interpret Revelation 13. But beyond that, there's also four lenses, separate lenses, that people also use to interpret the book of Revelation. Gosh. Yeah, so it's probably good for us to kind of talk about what each of those lenses are. So uh, the first is called preterist, uh, and that is a view that believes that most of the prophecies in um, Revelations, in the book of Revelation, have been filled. Obviously not the return of Christ yet, but most of the other prophecies have been fulfilled. Uh, different, uh, there's different measures within or different ideas within that group. Some would say that uh, everything's been fulfilled. Some would say uh, uh, much was fulfilled at the at the uh, destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Right. Much more was fulfilled later on, and then we're just kind of now waiting uh, the time of Christ. Uh, another view is a historist uh, view of Revelation, and that sees uh, Revelation being fulfilled throughout church history. And so they would see things uh, happening uh, by they would kind of connect what John talked about to different things that have happened throughout church history. 
Uh, there's also what's called an idealist or a spiritualist view. An idealist is it's not so much there's a specific fulfillment of, of prophecy here, but kind of transcendent principles or recurring themes that are happening. So less about pinning these dates, times, events to history, perhaps more about kind of symbolism and, and ideas. Yes, I, I think the, uh, all views would see there's symbolism here. It's what they say that symbolism means, like when... When is it fulfilled? When is it not fulfilled? So idealism is less about, they don't see a specific fulfillment, but sort of ongoing themes happening for every believer. So there's application there for every believer, uh, you might say. And then the fourth view, and this is the view that I would hold to, is a futurist view, or at least I'd hold to a kind of a, um, an adjusted futurist view. But a futurist view is basically that everything after chapter three does have an ultimate future fulfillment. So that we see in chapters two and three, all these uh, letters uh, to the churches, those have application for all churches, but they were written to seven specific churches. And then from chapter four on, those things have a future fulfillment. And so those are the four views. And depending on which view you take can really make a big difference, uh, just like what you view, what your view of is of the millennium mm -hmm. on how you would interpret all of Revelation, but specifically Revelation chapter 13. Sure. So some people maybe with more of a, uh, a, pr a preterist view would consider this beast and the number more to do with uh, Emperor Nero persecuting Christians at, at the time. But it, is it as narrow as that? Can we just pick a view and everyone agrees within those views what the interpretation is? Well, it's interesting because actually, even though they are quite distinct views and they do change the way um, you would interpret the book of Revelation as well as all of eschatology, uh, the truth is they have some things in common. All four views have some things in common. Uh, for one, within each view, there's debate. So in other words, it's not as if uh, the preterists all agree with each other or the futurists all agree with each other. Within each of these four views, there's debate about what these things mean. There's speculation on what these things mean. And I think it's important for us to recognize that it's not just picking a view and then, oh, this is the one where everyone agrees. Right. That's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. Also, all, few, all, all four views have in common uh, that, that what was written, what John uh, saw and, and had written down or wrote down himself, uh, what was written had application for the original readers. Sure, yeah. So when, that, when, uh, when the revelation was circulated to those seven churches and beyond, it meant to have a specific interpretation, which is really important for us. Yeah, they weren't just sitting around reading the letter going, great, this is cool for people in a thousand years. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. It has nothing to do with us, but maybe somebody will, be, will find this important someday. <laughs> now, it wasn't like that. They saw some uh, specific application. That's important to, to recognize, especially because the book of Revelation begins with uh, a promise of a blessing. Blessed is he who reads and hears this book. Oh, yeah. So there's a blessing for us to read. It's not just about, I now know the future. It's, it's bigger than that. Um, also, I think uh, all views believed that there was some sort of future fulfillment at the time that John wrote this. Even a preterist view would see that there's at least some things that will happen in the future, not just the return of Christ, but even some of the prophecies that would have a future fulfillment. Maybe that was in a matter of just a couple of years, but they would see that that would have a, a, some sort of a future fulfillment. So everyone saw that to some degree. And then all would believe that the beasts that are mentioned here, uh, that, that we just talked about in Revelation 13, as well as has their, they're connected to other characters within the book of Revelation, that all those correspond in some way to the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So there's some connection to Rome uh, as the city on, the, uh, on, on seven mountains or seven hills, and uh, the Roman Empire and these beasts. There's some connection in every view recognizes that, that there's a view there. So there are things in common that do make us see that you, we can know some important things from the book of Revelation. Sure, yeah. And, and with that, maybe kind of like more of the symbolism and the, the idealist view of, of this beast. Is it okay to think that there's been different beasts at time, at different times throughout world history? So that was the Roman Empire at one point, maybe to the Jews it was Babylon, and maybe there's been other world powers since then and today? Yes and no. So the idealist view would kind of say uh, that these things uh, um, kind of happen to all believers in one sense or another. And we'll talk, I think, maybe more about that towards the end, especially the idealist view. Sure. I, I think one of the things I discovered in the, the last time I taught the book of Revelation, which th was the third time I taught expositorily through the book of Revelation. Wow, good job. <laughs> uh, well, uh, what it really exposed to me was there's actually value in all these views. I could see where they were coming from. Much like the millennial views, I could see why people had that view. Mm -hmm. 
the, the thing is, if we're going to try to have a coherent interpretation, we do have to pick at least probably one group, but it doesn't mean that we have to throw out the other groups or the other interpretations. Yeah, sure. So even though I, I do see there's an ultimate future fulfillment, I, I was really actually quite encouraged by an idealistic view that there, there's, there's lessons to be made mm-hmm. uh, from all these things for all Christians always. And I think that uh, definitely corresponds to what we see about all Scripture, that, there, that the Holy Spirit's inspiring a specific author for a specific audience, yeah. and what was meant for them is what we need to learn from. Mm-hmm. And so obviously what was meant for the original audience was some sort of uh, uh, something that was going to happen in the future, yeah. but also something that was applicable to them right then and there. And so that tells me there's, a, there's, different, um, there's different values or there's value to different views. Yeah, sure. And we can definitely just remain gracious to people with other views. We're all Absolutely. working this out. We can't be sure and dogmatic and divide about these sure, things. Sure. But let, let's take it on our futurist uh, view then. I, I, I do like the bright side of, of thinking that it's all just ancient history then there's not too much to worry about, is there? Sure. But if, if we're expecting this uh, beast to come and there to be a, a potential uh, mark to happen, um, mm-hmm. should, should we be concerned then that uh, we could be taking the mark w- without knowing it? Is it going contact with something like that? Mm-hmm. And then that puts, puts us into the broader question of, uh, will it be governments and world powers who are kind of uh, restricting and impinging on our religious freedoms, making us have to choose? Yeah, and that, th- those are really good questions. In fact, uh, sometimes we can be dismissive of some of the conspiracy theories and things that are out there about one world governments. But to be fair, uh, there are things here that we need to recognize, again, that all four views would recognize. I think all four views would see that there's a need for Christians to be prepared to suffer for their faith. Mm. And so uh, no matter what your view is and how you interpret Revelation, all would agree that uh, no one's going to get out from underneath suffering if we're going to follow Jesus. Paul said really clearly, I think it's 2 Timothy 2.13, where Paul says really clearly, uh, all those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So it'll be to varying degrees in different circumstances and different times and different uh, parts of history, but still, Mm. we're going to suffer persecution. We, we, We should expect as Jesus followers to be a marginalized people. He was a marginalized savior when he came on the scene the yeah, first time. Yeah, didn't Jesus say that if people will despise the master, will they despise us servants as well? Absolutely. And I think I think that's one of the things that we agree with. So uh, it's interesting because uh, that's an important thing because sometimes the people with different views can accuse each other of escapism. Mm. And so sometimes people, specifically people can accuse uh, what we identified last last time as a dispensational view that they're escapists. And one of the reasons for that is when it comes to, say, what we're reading here in Revelation 13 from a futurist viewpoint, a dispensationalist, or at least most dispensationalists would say that, yes, this what this is talking about is a literal antichrist. So John tells us in his epistle that there are many, that antichrist uh, is going to come, or that you've heard antichrist will come, but there's also many antichrists. So uh, we would see that as there's a future literal antichrist who will one day be on the scene, a counterfeit Christ, uh, which is what we uh, really need to understand. Uh, Jesus seemed to talk about this as well in, in, in the Olivet Discourse. Um, so, so we would see in the futurist as that there is a counterfeit Christ that would be the first uh, the first kind of beast listed here, a political leader, uh, but also a counterfeit prophet who would be a counterfeit religious leader. These are the two beasts uh, tell, uh, talked about in Revelation 13. Mm. And so there would be a future fulfillment. But from a dispensationalist view, uh, they would say, but Christians, uh, those who are born again believers now, that Jesus will rapture or take them out of here before these things come to pass. Right. That they would see these things come into pass and what's known as the 70th week of Daniel, uh, what's also called the Great Tribulation. Mm-hmm. Many would see this happening in the second half of that 70th week or that seven-year period right. known as a Great Tribulation. And so they sometimes they're accused of being escapists. Right, because it's but, not a choice that God's people would actually have to make. <clears throat> yes, exactly. They wouldn't have to make this. They're just, they're just shanked out. But the truth is, all of God's people have to choose if they're going to identify with Christ, they're going to suffer with that. Mm. So there, there is a concern for me in, in, the present, in our present day sort of Western church culture 
where there's so much uh, out there that says, hey, just believe in Jesus and life will be wonderful, which I'm going, that doesn't really fit with Scripture. I don't think most people who take the Bible seriously would say that that fits with Scripture. Sure. So I think uh, most of my friends who are dispensational, leaning at least, who do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, they're not, es- they're not necessarily escapists. Right. They do believe we can still and will still suffer for our faith. Mm-hmm. Um, but they do believe that they won't be around for this. Yeah, sure. Okay. In, in one sense, few. <laughs> yeah. But to, to, to kind of draw it back to the original question, if, if, it's, yeah. if it's about, um, t- you know, taking vaccines or will it come in the form of like a, a chip in the hand, I've heard people sort of say. Yes. Um, for, for those of us who do think that this, this beast will crop up, the Antichrist will present God's people with a choice, it, does it come down to choosing very obviously between God or uh, some, you know, wrong person? Yeah, it, I think it will be uh, more obvious than some people uh, speculate. I think some people are more concerned with um, technologies that are around or even desires uh, among cultures, especially with this COVID-19 virus, especially with environmental issues. There is a lot of a call by world leaders and by people who have influence to say, hey, look, we need to be in this together. We need to have global solutions because these are global problems. And so for people who see this having a future fulfillment, that that can make us a little bit nervous. Like, what is this talking about? I think the problem is, is that we can get nervous about uh, a desire towards uh, sort of a globalist movement or a one world government that seems to be alluded to in in the book of Revelation, especially in, particularly in Revelation 13. Um, or, or even more uh, nervous about the technologies that might make that happen. A cashless society, um, uh, uh, a demand to to only use certain kinds of currencies, a demand to be vaccinated in a certain way. These are things that make people nervous, but that nervousness is more based on a speculation from this very fairly narrow view of eschatology mm-hmm. than it is on what Scripture says itself. Yeah. I think looking at church history, looking at the kinds of situations that Christians have faced in the past, they often Christians have often been persecuted for political reasons. In other words, uh, there was a political excuse given to persecute Christians. To, to use Nero as an example, of course, yeah. uh, a fire started. Christians are blamed for that, that fire, mainly because they were already a marginalized group. It was easy to kind of blame them. Right. We see that kind of thing happening in politics all the time, don't we? Sure, yeah. And so, so there, there, there's a chance that history is going to repeat itself mm-hmm. uh, and that we get blamed for something uh, that, that really isn't completely our fault. And therefore, there becomes a reason to, to persecute us. With that persecution could eventually come a time that says, all people have to do this uh, because this is the highest truth that we know. Mm -hmm. Now, what that's going to look like, I'm convinced uh, if we're around that we'll know it when we see it. Because I can't see God allowing us to be duped into something like, uh, like, hey, you can still follow Jesus. You can still meet as a church. Um, you, you can still uh, proclaim the truths you believe in uh, on media or what have you. Um, uh, those things are all legal, but we need everybody to take this certain vaccine. Now, there might be other reasons why people don't want to take the vaccine, but I wouldn't think that vaccine is the mark of the beast. Right. Or they might say, look, it's going to be better for, um, uh, for the world uh, governance if there's one uh, currency. Um, it is feasible that we could still uh, be thriving believers and be under a one world currency there's no nothing in scripture that says that we couldn't be right so a a global economy or one world government isn't necessarily something to rally against and fear yeah well not from the not necessarily from the perspective of eschatology not that by itself isn't isn't something that we need to rally against Mm -hmm. however i do i i do think we need to be sober-minded about things uh, one of the things that's worrying to me um, uh, about the way we in modern Western culture specifically look at author- is, is how we look at authority. The way we look at authority in modern Western culture is quite concerning. Mm. Um, scripture definitely uh, is very, very clear that God alone has absolute authority. Right. When Jesus c- claims to be king of all, when he, he, he expects us to have an exclusive allegiance to him. This is what you see. This is the call of Christians. 
So as Christians, we need to see Jesus as the ultimate authority. I mean, he says, why would you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do the things that we say? Sure. Now, the Bible does acknowledge a limited authority in, in basically five areas. It acknowledges in Ephesians 5, husbands having a limited authority over wives. In Ephesians 6, parents having a limited authority over children. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ephesians 6 as well, employees having... Uh, a limited authority over employee uh, employers have a limited uh, authority over employees. That's you and me, John. But yeah, yeah, that's you and me <laughs> exactly, uh, Ben. This is why I get to do most of the talking. Uh, <laughs> but also, it, it talks about in Hebrews thirteen, church elders having a limited authority over congregants, and then in Romans thirteen, that governments have a limited authority over their citizens. Right. And the reason I bring that out is that we are called as Christians to be good examples of submission. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus was a great, the greatest example of submission. He submitted himself to the Father. Mm -hmm. uh, he even submitted himself to, to certain governing authorities in, in the famous passage where uh, they're trying to, the, the religious leaders are trying to trick him about tax. Oh, right. And they present him a coin and say, you know, who should it go to? Yeah, exactly. They say, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And of course, Jesus gives this great answer. He says, whose image on it? They say, Caesar's. Well, then render to Caesar what's Caesar's and render to God what's God's. In other words, we are stamped with the image of God. So we give ourselves to God, though we will pay taxes to Caesar. Mm -hmm. so, so Romans 13 kind of echoes that sentiment. And so there is a, a sense of limited authority. What's concerning, especially for us as Christians, is how sometimes we're quick to say, whatever the government says goes. Mm -hmm. Or we're quick to say, whatever the government says, we should be suspicious of. Right, both extremes. Both extremes, and neither are actually biblical or healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what we should be, where we, we, I think we can strike a balance with this, is to see that, okay, look, if we see uh, Revelation have a futuristic fulfillment, an ultimate futuristic fulfillment, yeah. we can see that there is concern that when governments see themselves as having ultimate authority. And again, that's something that we've actually seen through history. Definitely. Uh, it's kind of repeated itself. Um, so we should be concerned. And so therefore, we shouldn't give governments ultimate authority. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so just like, uh, yeah, we, we should see those things as having limited authority. It's interesting, too, because if you look at the, the other four areas of limited authority, nobody has a, hard, has a hard time saying, yeah, that's all limited, especially in the West. I mean, in the West, we don't think husbands have any authority over wives. Yeah. Uh, uh, in fact, even a lot of Christians wouldn't say that. We think parents don't really have much of any authority over children, employees over employees. All these things are quite debatable. Church eldership, all these things are really debated about, well, really, where does their authority stand? It's limited. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, when, when, when governments say, you can't do this, you can only do that, we go, oh, we, we better just obey that. Right, yeah. Now, there's good reason in our current crisis to obey that, not, not, not least of which is, we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. So to live in a way that would kind of spread a potentially deadly virus is not loving your neighbor. So that government mandate is a good government mandate. We're thankful for that. Absolutely, yeah. um, but there, there may come a time when the government commands things that we're like, well, that's actually not just. Mm. Or that keeps us from obeying the Lord. Yeah, I think that's, that kind of forms part of the question we received. Yes. Where, where do we draw the line between where what the government may or may not be telling us to do or not do and our allegiance you know first to god as god's people yes i think this is kind of some generic rules or some general rules that we can have about where we draw the line on this um, when it comes to uh worshiping god exclusively if the government says blatantly no we're the highest authority you have to obey us and not obey what your religion tells us I think we have an obligation to humbly resist that. Mm. Say, I'm sorry. I'm not saying take up arms and resist that. I'm just saying, I'm sorry. I have to obey God rather than men. Yeah. Uh, when when uh, the government says that we're not allowed to worship the way God commands us to worship, again, we have to say, I must obey God mm. rather than men. Uh, I think when we get to a point when the government says, uh, we have rights over your children. You don't have rights over your children. And again, that can get, there's some a bit sticky and, and, and some gray areas there. Absolutely. But still in principle, it's when we have to say, no, we have to obey God yeah. rather than men. And so I think, I think there are some things here that are, are really important. And, mm -hmm. and so I, I, I'm sympathetic to people's concerns about these kinds of freedoms being eroded. But I'm also, I think, very uh, clear, at least in my mind, that we should be very slow to rebel. Sure. That our, our default position should be, should be of humility, mm. should be of gracious submission, yeah. and so definitely being of wanting to esteem others as better than ourselves. Yeah, yeah. 
So we need to be careful with that. But we also need to be prepared, even at the cost of suffering, mm. that we need to be willing to say, no, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, sure. Because suffering is something we can all expect as, as Jesus follows. And especially, especially if we end up going against what the authority that God puts there tells us to. Yeah, um, just just finish us off then, uh, John. This has been mostly from the believer's perspective. For, for any uh, people still considering these things who, who's tuned into our live stream and asking these questions about Jesus, they might be worried thinking, when it comes to this beast, his image, the authority over me, will I have a choice then? Do, do I still get to uh, you know, accept another way out of it? Because I, I mean, it's a bit worrying to hear in other parts, another sure. part of Revelation about the one who accepts the mark is kind of eternally damned. Sure, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, and and I, and I think it it it's it should be concerning in a very re- very real way because um, if there is something, I, I think what it really boils down to is it does boil down to allegiance. Mm. Uh, what is the highest authority in our lives? So so we like to think in the West, I'm the highest authority in my life, um, uh, but but actually what ends up happening is like what we've seen a lot is understandably the fear of death is the highest authority in people's lives. Mm. Uh, the great news is because our, our Lord Jesus conquered death, because he faced it, he conquered it, he rose from the dead, yeah. he's promised us a resurrection, we don't have to fear the sting of death anymore. Mm. Nobody looks forward to the painful process of death, but we don't have to fear the sting of death anymore, because um, Jesus is resurrected, he's alive, and he's going to resurrect us. Mm. Um, so I think I would challenge people who are, are just kind of thinking about Christianity, thinking about this Jesus stuff, and ask them, what's the highest authority in your life? Mm-hmm. When everything falls apart, who do you look to? Yeah. Uh, what, what do you, what's going to be the ultimate place of your hope? Because those things are connected. I think, too, it kind of connects into something that I think we'll probably talk about in episode uh, four, yeah. which is, what is your highest view of knowledge? Mm-hmm. Jesus said something in John chapter 8 that we'll look at next time. He says, you shall know the truth. He says, if you abide in my words, you're my disciples and deeds, he said. Uh, my, my disciples indeed." He said, and you shall know the truth. That's the truth from his words. You shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amazing. So Jesus says there's a truth, an ultimate truth that can be known and is liberating. Mm. What is that ultimate truth? Because that's the ultimate authority in our lives. Oh, that's such a great question. I know I'm really looking forward to hearing more about that next week. That comes directly from a question from you guys about science, um, evolution, Genesis 1, uh, truth and knowledge, all those kind of things. So do look forward to tuning into that next time. As always, if you've got questions, please submit them to us via the website. And if you want to catch up on any of John's teaching, that's available on the website on our YouTube page on Revelation specifically. So thanks, John, for your comments this time. And we'll say peace out for now, guys. Oh, 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 oh,